In the 1960s, Jim Hall was a race car driver and engineer who loved experimenting with wild ideas. He and his partner, Hap Sharp, built cars under the name Chaparral, always trying to make something faster and better. By 1970, Jim had a new idea for a car that could stick to the road like glue. And I'm in Midland, Texas, the home of the famous Chaparral cars. It's here that entirely new concepts in racing cars are designed, built and tested by the one and only Jim Hall. Jim has a sensational new car for this year's Can-Am series, so let's wish him luck with it. If this is the fan that helps suck the car downwards, what's this plastic skirt? Well, the skirt's a seal to maintain the vacuum under the car. It's made of Lexan, so it'll stand a 200 mile an hour impact. How does a car behave under these fantastic cornering forces? Well, get your hat and a suit and I'll show you. You call this a ground effect car. What exactly does this mean? Well, we pump the air out from under the car, which sucks it down to the ground. It allows it to corner faster, break faster than it uh, would if you didn't have it. Uh, for instance, uh, if the car would go around the corner at 80 miles an hour without the fans, uh, with them it'll go around somewhat over 90. This car will stop in about half the distance of a passenger vehicle. Everyone in racing was excited and a little scared about this strange new car. People called it the sucker car because of how it worked. Jim was sure it would change racing forever. Well, we called it the ground effects car, but uh, vacuum ground effects, but people called it the sucker car, so it's, it's been named that. Uh, we brought this car to the 1970 uh, Can-Am series, and uh, first time it had been shown in public, it was, it was, uh, it was impressive, I'll say, say that, but uh, it didn't win the race. Uh, this car has a tremendous amount of, of downforce. It's a follow-on to our other ideas. Uh, wings got uh, chopped off in a certain way, and so we decided maybe there was another way to go at it. And this is, in effect, a, an upside-down uh, hovercraft. Uh, hovercraft principle is you, you pump air into a, a space below it, and you pick it up just off the ground, and, and, it, and it glides around at very at low friction, almost none. Uh, this car, we've got a chamber where we suck the air out of it and pull it down. Uh, the way we seal it is with skirts that run uh, close to the ground. Uh, they're actually articulated. They go up and down with the wheels so that, so that they don't wear particularly, but uh, they keep that s small gap. There's one that runs across right behind the front wheels, and there's one that runs across the back of the car so that this whole area is sealed off. Uh, we then extract uh, the air uh, from that chamber with an auxiliary engine in here and a couple of big uh, fans. And uh, we pull, uh, we could pull in the racing trim about uh, uh, four to five inches of, of water underneath the vacuum. Uh, and that uh, translates to 2,000 pounds uh, of downforce. Uh, the car weighs about 2,000 pounds, so by just tweaking it a little, we could have driven it on the ceiling or on the wall. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, Lexan, uh, those skirts are made out of a polycarbonate uh, commercial name, Lexan, and we, uh, we propositioned GE about making a commercial and driving it on the ceiling. We said, you know, we could make a helix-shaped road and we could just drive it up on the ceiling and a guy could get out and shinny down a rope and leave it there. Uh, but uh, they, we, when we quoted the price, uh, they said they didn't want to do that. So uh, we, we didn't do it. And, of course, it probably would have been tricky because you'd had to have done a lot of safety devices to make sure you didn't break it or, or hurt somebody. Anyway, it would have been capable of that. The car uh, was extremely fast. It qualified on the pole or ran the fastest lap at every track it went to. Uh, it only, uh, it never finished a race with all systems working. It, uh, it, it finished uh, a couple of races, but, but uh, up, uh, oh, in the top uh, three or four. It didn't win any races. Uh, it was uh, outlawed at the end of 
of the uh, 1970 season by the uh, international uh, racing sanctioning body in, in France, uh, the FIA, and so uh, a suction vacuum car, a suction uh, ground effects car could no longer be run. Uh, so it only had a one one year life. Why did, why did they outlaw? What was wrong with it? Uh, I think it scared them. I, th I think it would go so fast around the corners that it had everybody afraid of what, what it might do. Uh, it's the capabilities of this car, given development, are uh, you can go just al almost as fast as a driver could stand. You could pull enough G's on him that that he'd black out, uh, you know, in every turn. So you, uh, it's uh, there were some reasons. But did you well, they did it on a technicality, and and that irritated me because. Uh, we had actually uh, taken this to the American sanctioning body, the idea, and said, we'd like to do this. What do you think? They all said, well, I think it's within the rules, just like we did. But uh, the FIA found uh, a technicality. Uh, they called the, uh, the fans, uh, or maybe the skirts, I've forgotten which, to be moving aerodynamic devices. And that was uh, articulated maybe articulated aerodynamic devices and their description of the chassis prior to that time had been from the uh, wheel center line up but they uh, they then included the skirts uh, in uh, as part of the chassis after that so uh, it was just a little change in how it was uh, how you read it and and that's the way they did it this was a, a real setback for Chaparral because if, if you look at the, at the last uh, few years before this, we'd had uh, the high articulated wing uh, uh, banned uh, by the FIA again on safety reasons because, uh, in my opinion, uh, when Formula One guys adopted it, they didn't do it very, very well and they had some accidents. Uh, so that was the, the reason they, they initially banned it, and then at the end of the year they just said, well, we're not going to run articulated wings. Uh, and I think that created a big problem because that's when, air, when airflow was really under consideration, and all of a sudden uh, I think the racing team spent just as much on wind tunnel work as they, as they did on the rest of the car. At least they do that today, and that's one of the reasons is because you can't run articulated wings. Anyway. We had that, uh, we had that uh, disallowed. We, had, uh, we took a high wing car to, uh, to Europe to run the manufacturer's, manufacturer's endurance uh, world championship, uh, our Chaparral 2F, and with articulated wing. And, and it was uh, quite a, a, a thrill for the crowd over there. And it was quite a good, uh, quite a good car. We won, won the uh, uh, BOAC 500 in uh, England, and at the end of that year, uh, in my opinion, because uh, Ford had such a successful uh, year in, uh, in that class, uh, the Europeans again decided to eliminate uh, the big stock blocks that we Americans ran. So uh, that, was, uh, that hurt us, and then in 1970, they disallowed this car. So. In, in three years, they'd just about eliminated every, everything we'd done uh, for, the, for the last uh, period of time. Anyway, it was a discouraging factor for us and very, very costly. And did you throw your hands up and say, I'm, I'm leaving, or what happened? What was your... Well, I, I didn't have anything. Uh, actually, I, I did. I, I, I said, well, maybe uh, this is not... Uh, uh, the sport I ought to be in or the game I ought to be in because it seems like everything that uh, that we've done the last few years is now illegal. And I didn't have anything on the board that uh, that I was really interested in pursuing at the moment, so I just said I think I'll just uh, I'll just take off for a couple of years and, and get out of this and see what, take a look at it from the outside and see if that's really what I want to do. Well, obviously it was you came back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got Jackie Stewart to introduce this car when we uh, when we first brought it out, and the reason I could get him is he wanted to know what it was. He he was really interested in himself, and and uh, Jackie was too uh, commanded too high a price for us. Uh, Chaparral couldn't afford Jackie, but he made us a, a a deal for this first race so that he could come over and run it and see what it was, and and he did a great job. Uh, I really admire Jackie a lot. He was a good sportsman and a and a really good race driver. 
And, and I, I had a little uh, kind of pause with him there because when we got there, all he talked about was safety. And he, and he went through the car and he looked at the seat belts and the shoulder harness and the steering wheel. One of the things we had done over the years is we'd come up with a removable steering wheel. And the reason we did that is so the driver could exit the car uh, if he needed to in a hurry. And that's, that's another Chaparral innovation, actually. Uh, I just used by almost everybody now. But uh, so he liked that, and he uh, he wanted us to change a few things. And then he started going around the track looking at everything, and he would talk to the organizers about the guardrails here and this and that. And I thought, oh man, this guy is really hung up on the safety. I don't know whether he's going to get in there and drive it or not. Well, I want to tell you that as soon as he got his work done there, he jumped in there and strapped on his helmet, and boy, he was he was on it. And he did a great job of driving it. Uh, he had some trouble. It ran out of brakes. And, uh, but he did establish fastest lap in the race and, and uh, had a great time. So it was a good introduction, and I really admire the guy. Well, I think everybody was shocked at, at the grip. Uh, you're not used to having uh, a capability of running uh, oh, almost two Gs in the corner. In those days, our tires were only... Uh, capable of about 1.1 or something like that. So we were, and we had in some corners with this, we were we were up to 1.7 or 8 Gs, which is you know 50 percent. So <laughs> I mean that's a lot, and uh, and braking. I could never drive. I tested it a lot, but I n could never make myself drive it into the corner far enough. I mean you see the corner coming, at the speed you're going, you say, well it's time to get on the brakes, and you put your foot on the brake, and and uh, the car stops. And you say, oh, gee, I could have gone a little deeper. And so you come around, you do it the next time, and, and you have exactly the same reaction. I mean, I didn't drive it enough to get to where I could actually drive it deep enough in braking. Because you're going to corner faster than, than you're used to, and it'll stop so much faster. This car was high drag anyway, so, but it would stop faster. A little interesting sidelight. If, if the engine quits and you can't get back to the pits in this car, the little fans We'll drive it about 30 miles an hour. <laughs> Even though it only raced a few times, the 2J left a big impression. It showed the world how creative thinking could completely change the way we think about speed and racing. Many of the ideas behind the 2J, like using air to create grip, were later used in other cars and racing technologies. Today, the Chaparral 2J is remembered as one of the most creative and daring cars ever built. It didn't get to race for long, but its bold design inspired a whole new way of thinking about what's possible in motorsport.